This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Uh, thank you for joining me today on this lovely Saturday afternoon uh, for my money talks on early American paper money, uh, specifically that that is in the ANS collection. Um, this is not going to necessarily be a comprehensive talk about all of early paper money. Uh, I will give a, a, an overview of, uh, of the series uh, overall, but then uh, kind of focus on the ANS collection um, and, and, uh, and how uh, the different pieces that, that comprise it. Uh, a little bit of background on why I'm giving this. Uh, Ray Williams, uh, who may or may not be in the audience right now, and myself, uh, we actually went through the uh, paper money, uh, early American paper money at the ANS collection during the quarantine. Uh, via phone um, and uh, we updated all the FileMaker files and Mantis looks a lot better as a result. Um, after the quarantine, once I was back in the office, uh, I kind of followed up on what Ray and I did and went through the physical collection of just the paper money so far uh, of early America and, and really was able to uh, you know, really full, uh, fully fill out the, the different files, um, you know, even down to, you know, making sure all the uh, handwritten uh, serial numbers and signatures were all correct and everything else like that. So, uh, so what is early American paper money? Um, there, I have it kind of classified into three different sections. Uh, the first is colonial, uh, the earliest uh, colonial paper money was issued in Massachusetts in 1690. Um, and uh, up, uh, various states issued paper currency, were really colonies at this time, issued paper currency up through uh, up to the Revolutionary War. Uh, they're issued irregularly. They, you know, unlike most uh, modern coins, they weren't issued every year or anything like that. Um, early on, they're usually to pay uh, debts from military conflicts. Uh, for instance, the 1690 Massachusetts was to pay for uh, King William's War, which was the American uh, kind of war of uh, the, the bigger uh, Nine Years War, uh, which lasted from 1688 to 1697. Um, early American paper money, are, they're technically bills of credit, which are uh, Kind of like I use, kind of like receipts. Uh, if you owed a debt, uh, you can use this. It wasn't necessarily legal tender all in all colonies, um, but uh, the colonial governments did accept them to pay uh, taxes, and that's you know kind of what allowed uh, this money to circulate. Uh, whenever the government owed a debt, they would pay it. Uh, with this early American money, and then they would accept it back in the redemption of taxes. Most of them are denominated in pounds, shillings, and pence. Uh, there are three exceptions that I know of, uh, 1709 in New York. Uh, certain bills were denominated in lion dollars. Um, 1750 Massachusetts, there are some fractional dollar, uh, dollar denominated notes. And then in 1767, Maryland also um, issued uh, uh, notes in uh, denominated in dollars. The 1750 Massachusetts are all fractional, so below a dollar, uh, whereas the 1767 Maryland notes, uh, they offer both fractional and one dollar and up notes. Uh, most of the different colonial uh, notes suffered uh, various degrees of inflation, uh, all at different rates from one another, and this actually uh, caused the creation of things like the, the York shilling and the New England shilling and the Pennsylvania shilling, uh, which are all different than British shillings and you know, eventually circulated at their own rate. And, and this system, believe it or not, actually lasted uh, up to the American Civil War and in some remote places up to the First World War. It's kind of interesting. Uh, the second kind of uh, uh, series that it, um, you know, that's considered early American paper money is state paper money, which uh, was issued to help uh, fund the revolution. It was issued a lot more regularly than the colonial notes, uh, just because, you know, again, there was a revolution going on and they needed money. So they issued it in uh, fairly large quantities. 
Uh, most of them uh, were issued in, um, uh, again, in pounds, shillings, and pence, uh, but slowly uh, certain states began to issue notes into dollars. I have them listed here, New York and North Carolina in 1775, 1776, there's Georgia, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, South Carolina, and Virginia, and later on New Jersey, and then later again, Pennsylvania. Uh, the third series uh, is continental currency, and this is similar, you know, even though we didn't have a federal government, this was, you know, akin to federally issued uh, uh, paper currency in that the Continental Congress issued it, uh, again, to further fund the Revolutionary War. Uh, this was denominated in dollars only, so no pounds, shillings, and pence. And uh, due to extreme uh, overissuance, uh, it, it uh, suffered uh, quite severe inflation. Um, by 1790, it was worth only about 1% of its original value. Uh, there are two uh, main reference books that I've uh, been using. Uh, the first is Paper Money of the United States uh, by the Friedbergs. Um, this is actually, uh, this covers all United States currency from the colonial up to the present. Uh, so really the, the only the first maybe 20 pages or so uh, uh, really talk about the colonial uh, early American paper currency. The other is the early American paper money of America by Eric P. Newman. Uh, and this focuses solely on, um, you know, early American paper currency and has much more information uh, as far as historical um, uh, different trends that uh, the Friedberg book doesn't necessarily offer. However, the Friedberg book is used by um, both collectors and grading companies uh, for their numbering system. So if you were to purchase a graded uh, early American paper, you know, it would most likely have a Friedberg number on it. Uh, so I'm gonna now focus on the ANS collection of early paper money. Uh, there's about uh, approximately 1,686 objects and that includes uh, official paper currencies of the original 13 colonies Vermont, which wasn't one of the original 13 colonies, as well as the Continental Congress. Uh, unofficial paper issues by private individuals, uh, most, most notably small denomination notes from New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania from the late 1780s and into the early 1790s. Uh, we have a few contemporary counterfeits and a few non-contemporaneous reprints, um, several uncut sheets, uh, one of which I'll show. Uh, we have some colonial lottery tickets, as well as copper plates uh, for printing, and, um, and also some non-monetary items like uh, land grants, pay slips, and other uh, similar documents. Uh, this is a breakdown of the different states, um, colonies, and the Continental Congress that are in the collection. Uh, to add up to that 1,686 number, um, as well as the date of issues that we have. Uh, this is kind of a pie chart of the breakdown of the exact uh, chart that you had just seen, just to kind of give a, a visual representation. Um, it gets a little cluttered due to all the small slivers. So I made another one that kind of breaks it down by region. Uh, so you can see notes from New England account for 15% of the INS collection. Those from the Mid-Atlantic states, 38%. The Southern states, 29%. And Continental Congress is 18%. Uh, this is kind of a timeline of the notes that are in the collection. Uh, each column represents a different colony or state uh, or, or the Continental Congress. And the thin line represents the entirety of time that the uh, that state or colony issued notes, and then the thicker colored in uh, section represents um, what notes or what years really are are represented in the ANS collection. So as you move up the chart, uh, you move through time. So as you can see, a lot of the earlier notes uh, we don't necessarily have in the collection, uh, and it's uh, mostly 
uh, is comprised of, of older notes. Uh, and also, if you go from left to right, I have it set up um, from the state or colony, really the colony that issued notes the earliest, so Massachusetts in 1690, and then South Carolina, and then as you go on, um, you know, uh, who issued notes last. So as you can see all the way to the right, um, Vermont, they only issued notes in 1781. Um, and we do have some, so uh, you know, it just gets a, a really thin but wide line. I'm going to give uh, a brief synopsis of this is kind of a blend between general information of the uh, individual states as well as how they uh, fit into the ANS collection. Um, Massachusetts notes were issued between 1690 and 1750, and then again, uh, 1775 through 1781. Um, I wanted to show that uh, that there was actually like a 25 year gap in between. And even in the earlier section, 1690 to 1750, by no means were notes issued every single year, but um, it just shows how you know irregular it was um, as far as issuing those. In the ANS collection, we have Massachusetts notes that range from 1744 to 1780. Um, our collection of Massachusetts notes is about 12% complete, which doesn't seem a lot, but uh, there were, for the early notes, uh, there were many, many issues of many denominations, and all of them are very, very rare. So uh, this is generally the case in, uh, for each state. Uh, you, you, we'll just have the later dates by default, essentially, um, and, and none of our state or colonial collections are complete as a result and just extreme extreme rare issues and hundreds of them i don't think this anyone has ever completed a uh, like a, no one's ever owned a complete collection of say massachusetts notes or or any uh colony for that matter uh, denominations ran from one penny which is very small to 100 shillings which is quite large uh, that suffered inflation um, after the 1690 notes, they issued another series called Old Tenor Notes in 1704. Uh, these were replaced by Middle Tenor Notes in 1737, New Tenor Notes in 1741, and then uh, finally the last issue of um, uh, uh, Legal Currency in 1759. Uh, this note in the bottom left uh, uses the word dollar, which is the uh, one of the earlier instances of such usage. Um, and this is actually the only note that in this whole presentation that doesn't come from the ANS collection. South Carolina issued notes from 1703 to 1793. Uh, the ANS collection is about 20% complete. Um, one uh, South Carolina shilling uh, was equivalent to eight pence sterling to give you kind of an idea. Uh, there were 12 pence um, in a shilling, so uh, the South Carolina shilling was only worth about two thirds of a British shilling. Um, much like Massachusetts, they uh, suffered inflation. The first notes were called proclamation money. This was uh, replaced by lawful money in 1748. Um, this was at the rate of one shilling lawful money for four and two thirds shillings proclamation money. And I just have a few uh, notes here uh, to give you kind of uh, an idea that, you know, just how they look. You know, you can see that there's a range of notes already. We've only covered two states and, and all the notes have looked fairly different. Uh, the ones on the right here, uh, I particularly like the reverse. I, there's really no other early American notes that look like it. Uh, the one on the left has a beehive. I thought that was kind of cool. Connecticut uh, issued notes from 1709 to 1780. Uh, our collection is about 23% complete. Um, again, inflation. They went from old tenor to new tenor to lawful money in a similar regard as, uh, as other states. Uh, but again, at different rates and at different times. And this caused uh, these different currencies to diverge and really formulate their own monetary systems. 
uh, I added this note on the left. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the note on the right to show how uh, Connecticut um, canceled their notes once they paid them out, and then they re when they redeemed them, they would actually uh, cut this hole into the center to show that it was issued, circulated, redeemed, and it's no longer good. The note on the left is a two pence note, uh, which is a low denomination note. Uh, it's also um, blue in paper, uh, and those are generally uh, used for anti, uh, sort of like a, a counterfeiting, um, it wasn't anti-counterfeiting itself because this note didn't necessarily circulate, but similar to like the counterfeiting shields that were issued in the mid 19th century. So people can compare their genuine notes to counterfeit notes. Uh, the blue papered notes of early America would be sent around and kind of used in a similar fashion so that people could compare their notes to, uh, you know, if they suspected it to be a uh, counterfeit, they can they can compare it to the the blue paper note um, and assume that it's real. New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire issued notes from 1709 to 1780. Um, this is uh, New Hampshire uh, notes are actually quite rare, so we only have uh, just over five percent. Uh, of those that are listed in the Friedberg book. Once again, they suffered inflation um, uh, and had to be replaced with uh, subsequent uh, types of, of notes. I added this note to the right here. Uh, it's a later one from 1780. And it's interesting because um, this was actually, despite being from New Hampshire, is actually printed in Philadelphia by Holland Sellers. You can see on the bottom here on the right, it says printed by Holland Sellers. Uh, that wasn't um, an anomaly only of New Hampshire. And uh, somehow, and for some reason, Holland Sellers, um, in the course of the revolution, ended up getting quite a few commissions from, from different states um, to print their money. So by 1780, some of the colonial, or really by this time, state-issued paper currencies started to appear somewhat uh, standardized just because they were being printed by uh, the same printing house. So, you know, early paper money from several states will have on the reverse this black and red design with this uh, rectangle center and, and essentially look the same from one another. All right. New Jersey. Uh, issue notes 1709, 1796. Our collection is about 31% complete. Um, unlike the previous state that drilled uh, you know, or cut holes through the notes when they canceled it, there are no known uh, canceled notes from New Jersey. And that's because they're the only state that burnt their notes upon redemption. So unless you have a pile of ashes that you can prove were at one time uh, early American notes from New Jersey, uh, there are no canceled notes. Uh, I added this note on the left um, to show the lower end of quality uh, that exists in the world of, of uh, early American paper currency. Uh, this is not a front and a back, it is a front and then the other side of the front. Uh, and it was, as you can see, torn in half. If you look on the right side uh, to the lower left-hand corner of the right side, you can see this right here is actually a piece of thread where somebody had uh, once uh, sewn the note back together and then it broke. And then if you look also on the top left of the right-hand side of the note, you can see this pin right here and somebody actually tried to pin the note back together. And then that again fell apart uh, fortunately, both sides of the note um, remained together, and and this is this is the result. Uh, this note on the right um, uh, is interesting. Um, this was actually uh, New Jersey notes were supposed to have three signatures, but as you can see, there are only two here. And after the first two individuals signed the notes. Um, uh, the British Army actually got their hands on all of these and issued them, uh, just put them out without the third uh, signature. And just to try and um, 
mess with the um, the monetary systems and economies of the uh, of New Jersey and, and of the um, the revolutionaries. Another interesting thing about this uh, note on the right is that it was signed by John Hart, who also signed the Declaration of Independence, which makes it um, a bit more desirable. New York issued money from 1709 to 1793. Uh, the Annus collection is about almost 20% complete. And I have a coin in here. Um, this is on the right hand side. This is an eight shilling note of New York. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this note was equivalent to one Spanish American dollar. Um, in New York and really all of the mid Atlantic states, I'm sorry, just New York, not the mid Atlantic states, it's only New York. Um, a dollar was was a, was equivalent to eight York shillings. And this note's also kind of interesting because on the the back side, on the bottom here, on the right hand side, this is actually uh, a waterworks, the the kind of inside workings of of a water uh, works um, like a pump for for water in New York City. So that design's a little bit different than than most others that you'll see. Rhode Island issued currency from 1710 to 1786. Uh, the Agnes collection uh, ranges from 1775 to 1786, so only the last few years. Denominations range, range from 1 36th of a dollar, uh, which was equivalent to two shillings, all the way up to five pounds. So again, quite a big range. Now uh, the Agnes collection's uh, just shy of 10% complete. So again, another um, uh, series where uh, a lot of the early notes are extremely rare and our collection is mostly comprised of the later dates. Like uh, many of the other colonies, uh, Rhode Island currency suffered inflation uh, where they had to go from old tenor to new tenor and then into lawful money. North Carolina issued notes from 1712 to 1785. Uh, uh, initially, the old tenor notes circulated for uh, one North Carolina shilling to pounds British sterling. Like all the other colonies, once again, inflation, inflation, inflation. Uh, the ANS collection of North Carolina currency is um, just about 39% complete. And these two Images I have here are interesting. I'll start with the bottom left image. Uh, this was actually uh, originally denominated at one fourth of a dollar, and somebody took it and scratched off one fourth or one uh, of a up top. So now it just says four dollars. And then also in the paragraph here, uh, they got rid of all the uh, extraneous stuff to make it worth one four Spanish mil dollars. Except over here on the left, if you tilt your head to the left too, it still says one fourth of a dollar. So they missed one. It's kind of interesting. That's this is actually probably one of the more common uh, methods of counterfeiting or altering notes that occurred. Um, it was the cheapest, easiest method that people can do to take one note and turn it into another note. It was simply you know, looking for these little kind of loopholes where they could uh, essentially just erase certain aspects of the note to try and make it worth more money. Uh, when Ray Williams and I found this note, we act it actually fooled us. We thought that it was a $4 note um, with some wrong uh, um, inscriptions on it. Uh, if you look down here, it says independence and uh, none of the $4 notes say independence, only the one fourth of the dollar. So at first we only saw the $4 and independence and we thought we had made a discovery. And then I had uh, uh, noticed this, this uh, uh, upright one fourth of a dollar inscription. So it was kind of disappointing, but still kind of cool. Uh, to the right here, this is a, not only is it an uncut sheet, but it's actually a bundle of 50 uncut sheets. And this is how uh, they were bundled together uh, in North Carolina at the time. 
as kind of amazing as this is, um, it's actually, believe it or not, not all that rare. Uh, there are lots of the, not, I wouldn't say lots and lots, but, um, but they can be had. Uh, there must have been a hoard somehow that was never issued and then stumbled upon uh, at a later date. Uh, this particular bundle was uh, a gift to the ANS by Joseph Flasser, who had a lot to do um, down at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation. Pennsylvania issued notes 1723 to 1789. ANS collection is a little bit more complete, just over a third. Uh, our notes uh, comprise the years 1756 to 89. Uh, and unlike the earlier notes, there was uh, no, practically no inflation. Um, not only is this kind of an, um, unique to the early American uh, paper money series, but really to most paper money issues throughout the world. Uh, this is one of the very, very few times where paper money did not uh, inflate over time. Uh, they didn't overprint, which helped, and they also made uh, this illegal tender. So unlike other colonies that you could only pay your uh, taxes with, um, in Pennsylvania, their, their currencies were illegal tenders, who, so they could be spent for, um, for most uh, transactions. And these two notes, um, the two little images at the top are both the obverses, and then the two on the back are the reverses for their corresponding notes. Uh, both of these were printed by uh, Benjamin Franklin. Uh, the one on the, the left is a technique that he himself invented, where he would take a leaf, um, essentially make an impression of it in uh, plaster, and then transfer that and make a, uh, a copper stamp essentially from the leaf to make uh, a unique image uh, since you know, no two leaves are alike. So if you found a 10 shilling note with another leaf on the back, you know that it wasn't genuine because all 10 shilling notes from this year uh, and denomination had that leaf and that leaf only. And on the right, uh, this is a lower denomination note, so it didn't really get the same treatment with the nature imprint on the back, but you could see uh, quite large that it was printed by Ben Franklin and uh, Mr. Hall. And uh, once Franklin retired um, from uh, Franklin and Hall, Hall moved on and, and eventually got his own um, uh, person to print with, and they became Hall and Sellers. And then uh, Hall himself died in 1772 um, before he was able to retire, and then Sellers uh, continued to print on his own, uh, but still using the Hall and Sellers name. Delaware uh, issued currency 1723, 1777, and we're about a quarter of the way complete of that collection. Really don't have a lot to say about Delaware uh, as their history uh, really um, aligns uh, with other states in the middle Atlantic states, especially that of um, Pennsylvania, which they were actually a part of at one point. Maryland issued 1733, 80 to 81. Uh, our collection is about a quarter of the way there and comprises dates 1767 to 1776. Uh, I want to specifically note the printer here, here AC and W Green. AC stands for Anne Catherine Green, and it is uh, the only early American uh, printer who is a female. So that's uh, quite significant, in my opinion, very, very important. Um, William Green, uh, I believe, passed away, and Anne Catherine printed. Uh, on her note, on her own, or at least uh, with an apprentice or something along those lines. And then I think, um, if I'm remembering correctly, perhaps her son came into this picture too, and it was AC and another green. Georgia. Georgia issued notes 1735 to 86. Uh, the ANS collection is about 38 
uh, percent complete uh, with notes ranging from 1762 to 1786. Uh, Georgia notes are interesting because they have different colored uh, seals on them. I have here the blue seal at the top, an orange seal at the bottom right, and then a maroon seal uh, at the lower left. Um, I think there's also a green seal. Um, so it's just something different, kind of interesting um, that just sets it apart from, from other colonial or state issues. Virginia issued um, money kind of late. They started in 1755 and, and ran to 1782. Our uh, collection is exactly one third of the way complete um, and ranges from 1759 to 1781. I have here uh, on the top right a Virginia note, uh, as well as on the bottom right a Bank of England note, and you can see that they're actually quite similar. Um, and then I also have a 1773 Virginia penny, uh, which was kind of um, kind of related, but not quite related to the uh, to the pound five pounds note at the top. Continental Congress. Finally, we come to the revolution and uh, the Continental Congress needs to fund um, this revolution. So they issued notes on their own. Um, on 11 different dates between 1775 and 1779, they authorized uh, various types of uh, continental currency. Denominations were all in dollars, no more pounds, shillings, pence, and they go from one sixth of a dollar all the way up to eighty dollars. The uh, ANS collection uh, is almost ninety percent complete. We're only missing eleven notes, so um, you know that's that's quite significant. This is by far our most complete collection um, in the early American series. If you look at the top right note, you can see that it was printed by Hall and Sellers, uh, whom I just spoke about. And uh, Mr. Hall was, of course, uh, an apprentice and, um, and later uh, co-owner of uh, the Franklin and Hall printing firm. Now, Congress issued nearly a quarter billion dollars of continental currency in order to fund the revolution, which is an extraordinary amount. Um, there were, as a result, uh, extreme inflation for three reasons. One was over issuance. Uh, second one was there is no coordination between Congress and the states. So as Congress was issuing this quarter billion dollars worth of money, uh, the states were issuing uh, their own uh, you know, prob you know, at a similar rate, just at much higher levels than before. And then also uh, the British counterfeited these quite heavily, um, you know, and obviously intentionally in order to uh, attempt to disrupt the, um, the revolutionary economy even further. <clears throat> the image on the top right I include because it's quite, uh, it's a quite famous design. Uh, this design was used on the Fujio sense of 1787, and then also a uh, similar design for the continental currency um, coins uh, of 1776, though it's not, they made, them, there's evidence that shows that they were actually made in the 1780s in England as well. Um, the notes on the bottom uh, I find interesting because as you can see, the uh, well, most notes are similar in appearance to the top right uh, note. Uh, you know, there's different little images, but the bottom notes diverge, uh, you know, quite substantially from, from the standard uh, design, um, including a marbled edge on the left, uh, which you could see. And it's actually quite significant because it's it's known that uh, Benjamin Franklin actually brought this paper back from Paris. So without a doubt, um, Benjamin Franklin held that paper, which is really, really cool in my opinion. Vermont. So Vermont is, uh, was not one of the 13 colonies. Uh, and in fact, when it issued this, it wasn't even one of the states. Um, initially, Vermont was a part of New York up until the 1770s when it broke off. 
um, and created an independent republic uh, that was never actually recognized by anyone. So despite the fact that they uh, you know, issued their own currency and we, you know, there is a thing called, you know, the Republic of Vermont. Um, no other government actually uh, recognized them as such. And in fact, New York still claimed to Vermont all through this period. Uh, denominations ranged from one shilling, uh, which is quite small, to three pounds, again, quite big. Um, and the INS collection uh, is 37 percent complete, which sounds quite healthy compared to others, but they only issued eight notes, uh, all from February of 1781, uh, eight different denominations, and we have three of them. Um, they're all very, very rare. Uh, the paper that they used was extremely brittle, so as you can see, the specimen that I have here actually has a, a more modern backer on it to kind of keep the note in place. All three notes that we have have the same backer, uh, and it's quite rare to find um, a note that hasn't been um, supported in, in one way or another. So what is the relationship between early American paper and coinage? I mean, they're both essentially used for the same thing, you know, to buy stuff. Um, but modern numismatists often don't consider them the same things. And some people who have, uh, you know, who have such uh, interest in uh, colonial currency might only collect uh, the coinage, um, whereas another person who has the same amount of interest might only collect the currency, the paper currency. So it's kind of interesting, but there are, uh, I mean, aside from the simple fact that, um, you know, they both have the same function, I mean, there are uh, some very uh, explicit connections between them. Now, this note on the right um, is very, very interesting to me. Um, it's a two penny note um, that was uh, is, is issued privately. And we, it's currently um, uh, cataloged under New Jersey. And um, as you can see, there's a backer on it. This is not the actual back that was printed on. It wasn't printed on a newspaper. This was added after the fact, uh, but it helped me discover a little bit more about this note. Um, if you could see kind of right in the middle, uh, right here is the date and the date is only listed as 179 dash. So we know that it was issued in the 1790s, but not, uh, it's not known when in the 1790s. But with this backer, I was actually able to Google parts of it and I found the original newspaper and it, um, it was actually issued in 1790, in September 1790. Uh, so that you know, almost definitively dates this note to 1790 and not to 1781 or later. Now, also the interesting thing uh, about this note is that the the backer, the newspaper, um, wasn't from New Jersey or New York or Pennsylvania. It was actually from Connecticut, from New Haven, Connecticut. Um, and um, and that was actually quite significant as well. Um, because if you go to um, if you uh, study New Jersey or I'm sorry, colonial coppers, you know that in 1790 there was uh, like a copper panic, and due to um, the overissuance of counterfeit coppers at the point, so that all uh, um, copper coinage actually devalued by uh, you know down to a quarter of its earlier. Um, value. So if you had, um, you know, the equivalent of a penny uh, in copper, then you essentially, you know, by the end of that year had a farthing's worth, you know, it reduced by, by that much. Um, so this note on the right, going back to the note is, I don't know if I mentioned this, but it was issued by Reuben Chadwick, right? That's the signature right here. It's kind of hard to discern. Um, 
but Reuben Chadwick issued this two pence note in May of 1790. Now we know 1790 exactly. And it's two pence lawful money of the state of New Jersey, right? Uh, so this, the fact that the newspaper came from Connecticut was threw me off. So I started to look for Reuben Chadwick and actually found him. He was a resident of, of all places, New Haven, Connecticut. So why is he issuing paper currency um, denominated in New Jersey money? Um, and it's due to this copper panic of the 1780s. Uh, most, like I said, pretty much all copper coinage reduced in value with the exception of New Jersey coppers. They were the one, that's one, one of the few copper coins uh, of this period in, uh, in the United States that didn't uh, lose all of its value. So as far away as uh, Connecticut, you know, people are actually issuing paper currency in the denominations of a different state, kind of just to bolster up its value and, you know, keep the value going. Um, you know, people were well aware that New Jersey coppers had much more value than uh, than Connecticut coppers. In fact, there are many, many uh, Connecticut coppers that are underweight that somebody took and then struck them over with New Jersey dyes just to make them look uh, like New Jersey coins to give them uh, that proper value. And the same thing is kind of happening here in Connecticut where this person is issuing um, paper currency in Connecticut, but under the guise of New Jersey just to keep its value up. So this is just one example um, of a, a distinct uh, relationship that happened at a very, very specific historical moment uh, where paper currency and uh, coins are um, essentially, you know, so related that you can't untie their history. Um, but unfortunately this history hasn't been tied together just because people who collect coins don't necessarily focus on paper money and vice versa. That is starting to, to turn around uh, and people are starting to not only recognize the relationships between American currency and American coinage, but also the relationship between American money and foreign money, which of course also circulated. Uh, the Spanish American eight reales and, and lower denominations were integral to the United States economy uh, in its early years. And, and people are really starting to understand this and really see it, all of this as, as you know, the material objects that comprised the United States monetary system at this period. So a really interesting piece. Uh, I am in the process of doing a write-up on this uh, Chadwick note. Um, so keep your eyes out for that. Uh, here's the land grant. Uh, one of our non-monetary objects that we have this uh, to give um, this is uh, awarded to Joshua Mercerall for 5,980 acres in 1786 to kind of give you an idea of how big this thing is. The, uh, the medallion, which is actually uh, wax covered in paper, uh, is probably about four inches in diameter. So the paper itself is, you know, one foot by maybe 18 inches or so. So a very, very big document. Uh, uh, it's very, very, very cool thing to, to just, you know, look at for, uh, you know, a half an hour or so while I transcribed it into FileMaker. You can see here, it talks about George Clinton, who is a very famous revolutionary, um, uh, uh, not Roger Morris, I'm sorry, not Robert Morris, but a fellow named Roger Morris, who I'm, I'm fairly certain was related to Robert Morris, uh, also signed it. So kind of a cool piece, very large, uh, non-monetary, but, but you know, quite, quite integral to, to the colonial era. Here's a lottery ticket from 1779 Vermont. And these functioned very much in the same way as modern lot, uh, lotteries do, where you know people bought a lottery ticket, and if your number was drawn, um, you won the money. And uh, uh, it was a revenue raiser for different states. 
Um, you know, whatever you didn't, the winner didn't necessarily get all the money. Uh, some of the pot went to to the state, and that was the whole point of it for the state to to even hold the lotteries to begin with. So in the ANS collection, um, I mentioned earlier that we have just about 1,700 items. Uh, about 1,000 of those, we have no idea where they came from. Uh, don't know who donated them. Uh, we don't know if we purchased them. Uh, we just don't know. Um, this is a list of people that I do know donated early American currency. I put it in chronological order um, in the three columns. Uh, so people have been donating as early as 1884 and then um, as recently as, as 2012. Um, not only do we have private individuals, but also some organizations. You can see in the, the far left column, the American Antiquarian Society and also the American Geographical Society. And I'm going to uh, just briefly go over four of these different in, um, sources. Harry Prescott Clark Beach uh, lived from 1871 to 1943. Um, we actually purchased uh, 48, 48 pieces of early American currency uh, from his estate, not from him himself, uh, as he had passed away two years earlier. Uh, this included 46 pieces of New Jersey currency, one New Jersey lottery ticket, and one Connecticut lottery ticket. Uh, the accession number for all of these is 1945.42, uh, and it is actually part of a lot, uh, larger purchase of uh, nearly 1,400 objects, which included um, his entire New Jersey copper collection. That was his specialty. Uh, but all of these nearly 1,400 objects only cost $778, which is um, uh, you know, quite interesting, kind of mind-blowing when you think about it. Uh, less than a dollar a piece, which, which is amazing. Almost, almost 50 cents a piece. Again, he prim primarily collected New Jersey coppers, uh, but um, his collection really was much more uh, diverse than that. Uh, he's from Upper Montclair, New Jersey, uh, and I actually was able to find his notebook um, in the INS archives. Uh, and this is a, a section of a page from it. Um, these, uh, this notebook was specific to his early American paper currency. Uh, these are for 1763 notes, um, all of the listings here. Um, and any note that he put a little check mark to, so you can see uh, one, two, three check marks, those are notes that we uh, now have possession of that we purchased. Um, and this, uh, this note at the top, is actually this bottom check mark, the very the very bottom listing of this paper. Um, you can even see the serial number for forty three hundred. He listed it right here, forty three hundred. Uh, he purchased it for one dollar um, uh, all the way back in nineteen forty one. Um, so it's quite interesting, and you could tell that he was also not only just collecting by. Uh, by state and denomination, but since he was listing the different signers, he was also collecting by signer, which is, um, you know, really a, a fine, um, a fine way to to collect. Actually, uh, before we move on, I actually have another article that I'm working on uh, for Jean, the Journal of Early American Numismatics, on on these notes as well. Um, not on these notes in particular, but something, uh, a, a robbery of these notes. So keep your eye out for those. American Geographical Society, uh, founded in 1851. They actually donated 97 pieces of early American paper currency to the INS in 1956. This included 60 pieces of New Jersey uh, paper, 34 New York, and three Pennsylvania. Uh, there is 182 notes altogether. Uh, I think the rest were obsolete paper currency. Uh, the accession number is 1950, 1956.9. Uh, all 182 pieces were appraised for only $20 at the time. So, you know, again, uh, prices that, uh, that most of us wouldn't mind um, purchasing anything for at this point. 
Uh, at the time, the American Geographical Society, they're actually neighbors of the ANS um, at the Audubon Terrace. We were all situated up there at 156th uh, Street at the time. Um, I, I actually meant to get rid of this. Uh, I found reference that they hold the largest map collection in the world. I now know that that's not true. Um, uh, um, so disregard that. P.K. Anderson, uh, another um, important collector of the time, uh, lived from 1894 to 1968. Um, after his passing in 1969, his estate donated 17 pieces of early American currency. Um, this was actually uh, out of a donation of nearly 5,000 objects, all of which have the accession number 1969.222. Um, he was a specialist in Latin American numismatics, having spent most of his adult life in that region um, as a civil engineer. That was his profession. Uh, and he also was a specialist in Oklahoma numismatics, uh, which, was, which was where he was born and grew up. Uh, he was uh, president of the ANA in, from 1963, 1965. And, and we have 12 of his notebooks that detail his collection. Um, so not only dealing with, you know, uh, early American paper money, but actually mostly dealing with Latin American um, numismatics. As, as again, that was, that was his, spe his specialty. Lastly, Eric P. Newman, um, 1911 to 2017. Um, we actually have 13 pieces that came from his collection that came from a trade. Um, he gave us uh, 13 um, early American notes and three obsolete notes uh, in return for what's listed as quote unquote early municipal, municipal notes. So I'm not sure exactly what, what he received from us, but that's as close as I can get. Um, uh, the 13 pieces included three New Jersey, five Pennsylvania, and five Virginia notes. Um, Eric P. Newman, of course, is amongst the most well-respected and, and well-known American numismatists of, of any generation. Uh, authored 13 books and hundreds of articles um, from St. Louis, um, and he practiced law from 1943, or I'm sorry, until 1943, before working for uh, the Edison Brothers stores. I mean, he rose up to the position of executive VP in 1968 and then retired in 1987, uh, but was still very, very active in numismatics for uh, decades after that. We owe, we owe a lot to him. We really do. Thank you. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, I'd be more than happy to take any questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Again, this was not necessarily meant to be any sort of comprehensive um, talk on this subject, but just to give you kind of a brief overview of what the ANS collection has in, in regards to early American paper currency. So thank you. Jesse, may I ask a question, please? You may. Thank you. Um, uh, first, this is an area I know nothing about, so I really appreciated the primer here. Excellent presentation. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, I, uh, I'm just curious, before the continental currency issues, was there ever an attempt by any of the states to redeem the currency of other states? And I realized with different inflation rates, that could have created economic havoc, but it also could have facilitated commerce, particularly between adjacent states. So I'm wondering if there ever was any attempt to create a sort of, if you would, foreign exchange uh, between the states. And again, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, they most certainly circulated uh, in between neighboring states. Um, but as far as actually redeeming them, I don't know of any cases uh, or if that was even legally permissible or or anything like that, but they they absolutely circulated among states, um, and uh, this kind of true uh, up through um, the Civil War. Uh, the further away you got from the issuing location, the less that currency uh, would have been worth, because you know in order to redeem it, you would have to travel physically um, to get back to that state uh, in order to get its full value. So. They, 
essentially, you know, like a, a, a note from New Jersey would essentially circulate at par, you know, after all of the, um, you know, exchange rates were had in Pennsylvania. But if you were to say, take it down to South Carolina, you know, it would circulate at a heavy, heavy discount if it, if someone down there would even take it at all. Um, so they absolutely circulate it among states, but, but again, not, not uh, the entire uh, colonial system, uh, just because of, of the redeeming um, patterns uh, and systems that were in place. So good question. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Jesse. Yes. Could you comment on the contemporary counterfeits in the ANS collection, both the extent of the collection of counterfeits, as well as how accurate um, and thorough the cataloging currently is or isn't? Um, the majority of the notes uh, are genuine notes. So the vast ma minority are counterfeit uh, pieces, contemporary counterfeit pieces. Um, the second part of the question was how uh, how well thoroughly cataloged they are, correct? Right. Does, does the current catalog accurately reflect which pieces are counterfeits? Uh, yes and no. Um, you kind of have to do some digging uh, just based off of how our current catalog system is set up. Um, so you, ha um, you actually have to go into the file to see whether it says counterfeit or not. I've tried to set it up so that it actually will say counterfeit in, say, the title. Um, but our current cataloging system doesn't necessarily allow for that. So we're in the process of transitioning to a different uh, catalog system that will better be able to capture um, the authenticity of things. Right. Um, so will there actually be a will there actually be a field in the database for genuine counterfeit or modern reprint so that um, researchers can do searches on that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, a lot of that information there right now there is a field for that, but it's kind of even amongst you know internally it's kind of like hidden uh, in our database. So you kind of right. have to go several layers down to even find that, like as a curator. Um, yeah, so, I remember that. Yeah, and um, another thing about our database is that it's actually, it's one of the oldest databases digital databases in the world. I mean, it was begun in the early 80s. That said, uh, there's been hundreds of people who have worked on it and have all put their own uh, spin on set things. So, you know, I could put in information one way that I think is the best. And then 10 years before, 10 years later, someone's going to do something else that they think it's the best and, and it doesn't line up. So that's happened many, many times. Yeah. So again, uh, Unfortunately, it takes a little bit of digging to find out which are genuine and which are counterfeit. I've tried to make it more easily accessible, but uh, until we make this full transition, it, it won't be 100% accurate. Okay, thanks. I'll be in touch. Thanks. All right. Excellent. Yeah, if you do have any questions about specific uh, examples, whether I showed them or not, please, by all means, anyone can reach out. There's a question in the chat about the Cohen reprints of New Hampshire. Can you talk about those? Um, let me see. Um, I don't quite see the... the it just asked you to make a comment on them. What, what were they and when were they done? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't see... I, um, so. Cohen somehow got, I'm assuming that there are original uh, plates and he made reprints from them um, at a much later date. Uh, they're not 100% filled out, so they're quite easily discernible from originals. Um, and the dates that he chose or that he was able to make reprints of, I believe, are 1738 and 17, I think there's another date too, maybe 1740. Uh, those are extremely rare uh, issues in, in uh, genuine pieces. So not only, uh, you know, are they discernible just from the print quality, but also just the paper quality, you know, you'll be able to tell the difference pretty easily. Uh, there may be other small, um, you know, nuances that he put in there to, to be able to tell himself. 
but as far as um, I haven't necessarily studied the Cohen reprints um, by themselves, I've come across the ones that we do have in the ANS collection and have been able to, uh, you know, separate them and distinguish them from uh, from genuines. But as far as any uh, intimate knowledge is of them, I, I unfortunately haven't been able to uh, research them fully at this time. About when were they done? Uh, I want to say in the 1860s. Is that correct? Anyone? Okay, we're still here. Uh, yeah. So we'll get back to that one. Um, you have another question in the chat. Okay. Yeah, there's a couple. Um, we'll start with um, the blue 2D Connecticut note you showed was signed. Was that a fraudulent signature to try to circulate it? No, um, that's that's a, actually a very good question. I'm one, I have come across some blue notes that seem to have circulated as well. Um, so I'm not sure if that blue note was actually meant as this counterfeiting, or if it was, and then someone simply just signed it and uh, spent it. I'm assuming it's the latter, um, but but I, I again I can't uh, I can't definitively say that um, at this point either. There's actually right before that one. There's a private uh, question it says, please define a complete collection. Is it from Newman? I was actually going off the Friedberg uh, catalog to quote unquote, define complete, um, just because uh, of his numbering systems. And I actually have um, the copy I've been using here. Uh, Ray Williams gave it to me. Thank you very much, Ray. And I've actually used it as a checklist. Uh, so that's why I use that one in particular, just because uh, Friedberg, the numbering system is just much more simpler. And also, um, I already had it as a checklist. Um, after uh, the question about the blue notes, uh, Dan uh, asked, or actually um, uh, not a question, but made a comment that he's seen blue notes signed and some blue ones that are also slit canceled. So this suggests that they circulate it. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I think that, you know, again, without any definitive uh, proof of what I'm about to say. I, I think that they were initially, you know, intended as this counterfeiting. Some of them got into uh, not the most, uh, um, you know, truthful hands and, and they circulated as a result. But this, but again, that's just conjecture at this point. There's another question. I mean, there's a couple back and forth comments, but mm -hmm. the question is, did those New York notes with watercolors on them have any financial connection to raising funds for water projects? Um, they, I'm not sure about that either. Uh, they very well could have. I know that some notes were issued for um, different building projects. Uh, whereas other notes were uh, issued with the backing of land, uh, which is a little bit different, but, um, you know, different, uh, I, that could be the case. If anyone wants to uh, chime in with any um, other more definitive pro um, information on the Waterworks notes. Jesse, I think that the Waterworks notes were uh, basically uh, all good intention, but I don't believe that any Waterworks was actually established in New York City until about the 1830s. Okay. That's my understanding. All right. So there you go. Yeah, actually, now that I'm recalling, uh, I think that um, the design uh, was just a proposal for the Waterworks. Uh, the gentleman's name, too, I had in a note somewhere. Um, but yeah, I, I believe that that is the case, that, that it was essentially just a proposal for the Waterworks. Um, and maybe the, I, if Ray can answer to this, is it possible that these were uh, intended to be used to raise for Waterworks, but the project never occurred, or was it just a design? Uh, 
Well, that's my understanding. It's an accurate design uh, for a water pumping system. But, uh, and that was to promote it. And from my understanding, uh, that was to raise some funds. Mm -hmm. Exactly how that was to be done, I don't know. But, uh, you know, when it came down to it, nothing happened until decades later. Right, right, right. Thank you, Ray. Um, uh, David Gladfelter says there are at least four different kinds of paper used on New Hampshire reprints, make me think that others, uh, that uh, individuals other than uh, Joshua Cohn were involved. Uh, it's interesting, still looking for info, which is scarce, not ready to publish anything yet. All right. So there are people working on the Cohen uh, um, question at this point. So uh, hopefully more questions can, uh, can be answered about that in the near future uh, by David. Uh, Larry Schwimmer, good talk, Jesse. Thank you, Larry. The Continental Congress collection is almost complete. While the notes cost more than $20 now, they're reasonably in, say, EF, yes. What is the feasibility of a wait list and modest campaigns to finish? Um, I actually, uh, I'm a member of the EAC um, and every member of the EAC gets 10 lines of text in the back of, um, of their, uh, or was it the, um, yeah, in the back of the Pennywise. Um, and I put a little call out to see if anyone would be kind enough to donate them. Uh, I didn't get any responses from that, but uh, um, we do have funds uh, put aside at the ANS specifically for colonial money uh, in large sense. So it is a possibility that we may be able to finish it um, in the future. Um, if I'm recalling correctly, two or three of the notes are reasonable, um, but the other seven or eight are some more, some more of the pricey, pricier ones. Uh, I think from uh, 1778, 1779, there's a few uh, that are a little bit more scarce than the earlier dates, and those are, are what we are missing mostly. So, Jesse, is this a want list that you published? It is. Was it ever sent to ANS members? No, it's actually just in the back of the um, of uh, uh, the um, uh, the anyway, Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um. Yeah, that was. I didn't make an actual want list necessarily for for ANS, um, but I um, I could. Um, another thing I'd also like to mention is that. Uh, Currently, um, most of the collection is photographed. Uh, about uh, one sixth of it isn't photographed. Um, and uh, like other things, you know, everything costs money. Um, and unfortunately, the uh, the photography of the early American paper currency is kind of low down on uh, our list of priorities, unless we are to get funding for it. So. Uh, if there's anyone who would, who has any interest in seeing uh, the entirety of our early American early American paper currency completely photographed, um, you know you can have a direct impact on that, uh, and your name uh, will forever be linked to those photographs uh, um, as as a donor. Um, I know that. Uh, that several people have um, donated uh, in the past for um, to become image sponsors uh, that has helped us greatly. Uh, uh, specifically, our um, our colonial coins, um, you know, all, all have image sponsors. So that's my little plea as far as uh, making sure that everything eventually gets uh, photographed in our collection. If there are any other questions, um, you may uh, type them out, or um, if you're muted, you can unmute and just simply say it.
Well, we are over the hour, so we don't have any more questions. I think this would be, this is the last call for questions. And <laughs> I think we're gonna wrap it up. Anybody? Well, thank you, Jesse. Thank you for everyone who came today. Um, this will be recorded and put up on YouTube if you wanna send to any of your friends. <laughs> um, all right, one more call for questions. All right, well, thank you, Jesse. Yes, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ray, for all your help with these objects. Indeed, yeah, thank you, Ray. This this presentation wouldn't have been possible without Ray Williams. Uh, I wouldn't have even been able to, you know, I wouldn't have updated the collection without him. So thank you, Ray. Many thanks, great, great presentation. Thank you, thank you. All right, and if there's any questions about any particular pieces or if you're too shy to talk here, by all means, uh, send me an email. Um, uh, at jcraft, J-K-R-A-F-T, at numismatics.org, uh, or if you just go to numismatics.org, you can find a way to, to contact somebody there. So thank you very much again, and uh, appreciate everyone's time this afternoon. Thank you, Jesse. Thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Take care. Thank, Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.